everyone's ready now. Hi everyone, hope you're having a good day. Um, up next we have a workshop by Joanne Carroll of the Irish Film Archive and Marta Bastillo of Trinity College Dublin. This workshop is entitled Planning a Symposium to Promote Your Collection and it's going to offer us some practical guidance on how to plan a symposium to promote library resources and special collections. Um, before we begin, um, I'll give a short introduction as to who Joanne and Marta are. So Joanne is currently working in the Irish Film Archive. She has an MA in History, which she completed in 2009, as well as a Master's in Archive and Records Management, which she finished in 2011. Uh, the bulk of her work following her Master's has focused on digitizing, digitizing contemporary and archival records, and preserving and providing access to archival and digital materials. Uh, she's currently working as the archivist for the Liam O'Leary Collection for the Irish Film Archive. And prior to this, she worked as a digital photographer for the Clark Studio, Studios Digitization Project. Uh, Marta is assistant librarian in the Digital Resources and Imaging Services Department in Trinity College, Dublin, uh, working as a metadata cataloger for the Clark Stained Glass Studios collection. Prior to her current role, she has managed digitization projects at the Library of the National College of Art and Design in Dublin and the Fleet Library at the Rhode Island School of Design. She is an MA in, his, in Information and Ma Library Management from Northumbria University and she also has a PhD in Art History from Trinity College Dublin and has taught art history at undergraduate level at the National College of Art and Design and Trinity College Dublin. So I'm going to hand you over to Joanne and Martin now and I ask you to give a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Georgia. Um, so you're all very welcome to this workshop on planning a symposium to promote your collection. So to give you an overview of the workshop, myself and Marta are going to present briefly on the Clark Studios Symposium, which was held this time last year in the Long Room Hub in Trinity. And then we're going to break you all into groups of five or six groups. We'll have to count and see how many people there are. Um, and then you're going to discuss your own symposium and plan your own symposium um, based on the collections that we have here for you, which we'll give to you. And then um, you can present the symposium plan to us, and then we'll do a wrap-up at the end, any questions that you have. So, I'll hand it over to Marta. Okay, so this basically started um, when Joanne and myself started working on this dream collection. That's all I can call it, because for a, a, a historian archivist and, and an art historian librarian, this is the kind of collection that you just dream of cataloging and digitizing. Um, so we were working on the archive of the Clark Stained Glass Studios, which is housed in the Manuscripts and Archives Research Library in Trinity College. And we realized, initially we thought, okay, this is the kind of collection that art historians would be interested in because it's Harry Clark, because it's um, all to do with stained glass. And then we started coming across the variety of materials that were in the collection. And we realized that in fact it was of relevance to many different types of constituencies, uh, from people interested in migration studies, uh, to gender studies, uh, to anybody looking at trade and um, uh, the economic history of Ireland, um, all sorts of things that we never envisaged initially. And to me, the wake-up call came when I um, got in touch with, uh, with somebody in the history of art department in Trinity who is a specialist in Irish art history. And when I told her what I was doing, she said, I know nothing about this archive. And I thought, oh. <laughs> How is that possible? Because the archive had been in Trinity College since the 1970s. So we thought we have to do something to promote this collection. What are we going to do? And then that's when we started thinking about organizing a symposium to publicize what was in the collections. And what we're going to do today is to share the, the, our learning curve in a way, and to get you thinking about collections that you may want to be promoting in your own, in your own institutions, and how you would go about organizing a symposium to promote those collections. So these are the kinds of things that we're gonna be talking about. Um, probably none of what we're saying is in any way rocket science or anything new to you, but it's actually very difficult to gather all this information in one place. 
So what we've done is we have put together a handy pack for, for well, not for all of you, because there's a lot more of you than we expected in the first place, uh, but for several of you, and we can email it to you if, if you're interested in it. And we're going to talk about the main steps that we took to organize the symposium, and then we're going to hand out, uh, organize you into six groups, hand out um, the handouts for, for the symposium, and a case study for a collection. Now, these are collections that we have grabbed pretty randomly from institutions around Ireland. Um, and we want you to think about what you would do to actually organize a symposium to promote that collection. Um, so, let's get started. I'm going to talk about several things, but basically, I'm going to cover the first three points on that list, and then Joanne will cover the last three. Okay. So, in, first of all, if we want to organize a symposium, um, you want to think of, of a symposium as, as a research day. Um, and you want to think of it as, okay, if we want to promote this collection, what are the research questions that we want answered through this symposium? In other words, what are the themes that we want covered in this symposium? And who is going to talk about them? Who is going to attend? And how are we going to actually get them to come? So the first thing that we did was we created a, a symposium advisory group. Because although I have a background in art history and Joanne in history, we're not specialists in Irish stained glass or in Irish 20th century history, so we felt we really need somebody who knows what they're talking about. And so our symposium advisory group was cons consisted of uh, an art historian internal to Trinity, an art historian external to Trinity, and then two of our line managers and Joanne and myself. We didn't meet very regularly, I think we met three times in all. Yeah. But basically, the specialist art historians told us who were the people who would be interested in this, and also who were the people who we could contact to suggest possible names of speakers. That was really, really fruitful, because in the process of contacting people um, to ask about who could be interested in presenting about this, that gave us an opportunity to promote the collection in the first place. And we did make contacts with people who knew nothing about the collection and ended up writing papers about it. So that was great. Um, the other thing is that came out, out of this um, symposium advisory group is that you have to think really inclusively about who might be interested in your collection. Now, initially, I certainly was only thinking about maybe art historians and historians. It turned out that the people who actually attended our symposium were stained glass artists, um, digital humanities people, um, members of religious orders, members of the wider public who had stained glass windows by Harry Clark in their local church. So. Think very inclusively because you don't know who actually could be interested in your collection. And as I say, the prospective audience is always a lot wider than you think. And I know we librarians tend to think that we know who is interested in our collections and we know what they're going to do with, with them. No, we don't. Trust me. Just put it out there and let them come. <laughs> okay. So... As I was saying, for the selection of speakers, input from your advisory group, contact experts in the field. So we contacted the art history department and the history department and the theology department mm -hmm. in, in Trinity. And initially we thought that somebody might be interested in speaking at the symposium. It turned out that what they were interested in was suggesting people who really were interested in this. Um, so, and we followed their leads, and it turned out that somebody, for instance, who was interested in um, Irish priests working in African missions ended up giving a paper about this collection. So, go figure. <laughs> of course. Um, 
we didn't know for a while that the Harry Clark Studios had made windows for African churches. But they started looking into it and they found out and they gave a, a fantastic paper and they are now researching this. So, um, and then as I was saying, use the act of looking for speakers as a means of promoting your collection. This collection was not as widely known as it should have been and now it certainly is. And as a result of our efforts promoting the collection, there is now a PhD student working with the material in, in the archives in Trinity. So, okay, and this is where it gets a little bit sticky. <laughs> Funding sources. Because of course, even if you, and I know that the NSA and SL people know about this better than anyone else. <laughs> um, even if you're trying to run things on a shoestring, you're still going to need a little bit of money. But there's always little pockets of money here and there that you can tap into. What we did was, our department is based in the Trinity Long Room Hub, which is a, an interdisciplinary humanities uh, institute. And they offer every year um, research uh, incentive funding. And the funding could be for symposiums or for traveling or whatever. But so we applied for the funding and we got it. And in the act of applying for the funding, because you really have to think about what you're trying to achieve with your symposium as you fill in the application, we had much clearer ideas of what we needed to do. But then, of course, there's national funding, there's international funding, and what you really need to do is be aware of the deadlines for funding calls. In the pack that we're going to give you, we give a few links to possible sources of funding. It is a time-consuming process, but if you work with the research office in your institutions, you can always get guidance on that. Okay. And then um, we have been quite um, nitty-gritty in the, in the handout, so we're telling you if you're putting in a, an application for funding, you're going to really have to justify your funding. And sometimes you think you know where you're going to be spending money on, and then it turns out that you're spending all your money in your leaflets, for instance. <laughs> so these are some of the budgeting categories that you need to think about um, if you're going to organize a symposium. And never underestimate things like car parking and miscellaneous, because <laughs> they can turn out to be quite a lot. OK. Is that you now? Um, yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so for a venue, obviously, we were quite lucky because we had the Long Room Hub in Trinity, so that's like a venue that sort of comes all in one package. But um, to think about the venue, you want um, a good size, of, dependent on the size of the symposium you're having. Um, things like technology, like projector, computer, um, speakers, um, if you're doing video in or podcasting, um, obviously good mics, um, and then a nice place for lunch and tea and coffee and then easy access to toilet facilities and those sort of practical things. Um, I think you were doing the catering. Okay, so um, in terms of the catering, um, again, from our experience, we were working with whatever parameters exist within Trinity. So it worked well because we could use Trinity catering and um, we didn't need to be worried about getting too many quotes or whatever because we were using a, a, the approved supplier but, uh, for our institution. Uh, hotels were an issue. We needed to find out what the approved hotels were in our institution, and I'm sure it's the same um, in other places. Um, but basically, once you start doing something like this, you really need to work with the admin people in your, in your organization. And if you are in a very small organization, then you need to think in terms of um, hotels that are near the, the venue and um, catering that's nice and not too expensive, all those kinds of things. Okay, so for the registration we used Eventbrite and I know Claire and Helena were um, bigging up Eventbrite this morning, but it is, it is really good and like it's free 
Um, it's really usable by anybody who can get access to the internet. Um, so you can, we um, decided that event was going to be free and open to the public, but you can choose to charge for your event and make it private as well, so you send out invitations by email. Um, and just be aware that if your event is free, that about 10 to 20% of people who register may not turn up. Um, so you can account for this in the amount of tickets that you're going to release. Um, Eventbrite is great because it emails um, reminders to people of the event, but then you can also use it to send out updates or any reminders to, any, to people who are coming. Um, and then an important thing is make sure you reserve an amount of tickets for people who are speaking and for yourselves as well. So you just have enough room to fit everybody in. So the website, um, we used WordPress for our blog page. So you can see the pretty picture there, the Harry Clark design. Um, so this is for the more practical side of things. We're telling people about accommodation, what the venue is, the list of speakers and their biographies. Um, and then it can act as well as a blog page, not only for the collection, but for your project as well. So it doesn't have to be just for this one event. You can stretch it out and use it um, as it updates to keep people interested in. Um, and then after the event, you can use it to include any presentations or slides, or if you're podcasting the event, to put the podcast up there as well. So then promotion. Um, promotion is great because you basically want to get the right people who are interested in your collection or interested in your project to your event. You don't just want anyone, any old Joe Soap coming in off the street. So um, you can use um, academic and professional listservs. Um, use your communications office in your institution. They can put it up on their blog page or their social media, out to their um, newsletters to their alumni. Um, you can tend, attend other similar institutions or similar events like this one and um, network or give a paper and um, just basically promote your event and promote your collection. And then obviously social media is great. Um, you can use Facebook or LinkedIn, which are more traditional, or else if your institution's a bit more forward thinking, use an Instagram or Snapchat. Um, if you get your institution's approval, of course. And then obviously Twitter is huge. Um, we use the hashtag Clark Studios. Um, so use a sh uh, hashtag that's short and easy to remember. And just encourage people to tweet as well on the day if, if appropriate. So then on the day, um, there's a couple of pictures. Um, just bear in mind as well that on the day something may happen that you're not um, prepared for. Like today, for example, we were prepared for about 20 to 25 people coming to this workshop, and then we have about 50. <laughs> so something's going to happen. And at the Clark Project, um, or the Clark Symposium, the night before, we had Ken and Muriel Ryan, who from the Abbey Stained Glass Studios, who arrived at about 7 o'clock the night before to the Long Room Hub and started putting up all the props that you see in those pictures. Um, so they were there for about two hours. Um, so something will happen that you cannot plan for. Um, so then on the day, have posters and signs to guide people, um, just make it easy for people to get their way around the event, um, reserve seats for speakers and chairs, make sure that the speakers and chairs know how to use the technology and the microphone, make sure there's enough water, um, liaise with your caterers or any vendors that you're using, make sure they know where they're going, and as I said, encourage attendees um, and speakers, whoever, to take pictures and tweet on the day, if possible, um, if appropriate. And then if you're podcasting the event or recording, video recording the event, make sure um, if you don't have a team to do it, um, to press record and to stop on the microphone, because I did that for one speaker and I still feel bad about it. <laughs> I forgot to press record. Um, so then after the symposium, um, as I said, you can use your um, blog um, site to upload any slides or podcasts, or you can bed links to um, a SoundCloud or SlideShare um, if you're using those sites um, also place photographs from the day um, and then you can create a storify as well from the tweets um, that any hashtag that you use um, you can create a storify that has to be done within two weeks of the event and then other activities um, think about offering gifts to speakers we were lucky because we had clark stained glass studios um, designs that we were able to print and like give in frames to speakers as a thank you um, and then also Make sure all your speakers are refunded for any expenses that they have. I know each institution has different procedures, so just make sure they're aware of it. Um, also, on the blog, you can create a feedback form, a feedback survey, and send to people. We use SurveyMonkey, which I know Trinity had an account for. I think you have to pay for it. But Google has uh, Google surveys, which I think is free, so it's very usable as well. Um, and then from this feedback, you can write a report and give the good sides or the bad sides. Or you can make a um, 
workshop out of it and present it a year later at some <laughs> conference. <laughs> so, so <over> okay, <laughs> so it's now going to be over to you. Um, let's um, go quickly over what we need you to do. So we're going to be handing out um, packs with our summary of what you do for a symposium, and you're going. Each group is going to be assigned one collection. Now, you're not. We don't have the time to actually go over the practical side of things. You know, the venue, the catering, the uh, the funding, and all of that. We wanted to think about this in a much more high-level way, which is, we have this collection. What are the themes that we'd be interested to look at in a symposium about this collection? And who are our constituency? Who could be our speakers? And who will be our audience? Because basically, the practical stuff is easily learned, and it's all in the pack. Where it really when it really comes down to it, the success of the symposium depends very much on you asking the right research questions and, the, and thinking about the right themes and getting good speakers. We're not going to ask you to name names of, of speakers. We're just going to ask you to think of the types of speakers that you will want to attract and the types of audiences that you will want to attract for your symposium. And also, look, um, also to look at the promotion as well, because yeah, exactly. um, like we, the things I mentioned there, but if there's anything else that you can think of, any sort of ingenious ways to promote a symposium, let us know. Okay, so as I said, we have picked these out of the ether, and so um, the Kevin Barry papers, <laughs> uh, the Liam O'Leary archive, uh, the Sheehy Skeffington papers, the Robinson, Robinson caricatures, the Singh papers, and the Irish colleges in Europe uh, from the Irish Jesuit archives. And what we're asking you to do is, okay, if I was going to organize a symposium to promote this particular collection, how would I do it? You're going to get a little summary for what the collection is, how many items there are, where it is, and all that kind of thing, to just get your thinking going. Um, we're going to give you... Um, flip charts and markers. So we need you to get yourselves organized into groups of six. I don't know how we're going to do this. Six um, groups. So sorry, uh, into six groups of about <coughs> 10 people, more or less. Yeah. Um, so if, OK, yeah. uh, we probably need you. OK, so first of all, so. can you all the guys get together and
Okay, just so you know, you have 20 minutes and then each of the groups will have to choose one person to present your findings. Is that okay? Uh, and the other thing is that initially we planned for six collections, but in fact there's only five, five groups, so uh, the final collection is not going to be discussed. Okay?
two minutes. Okay, time's up, everybody. So, um, which can we start in? Can we start over in this corner over here? <laughs> okay, hello, everyone. Hands down, please. <laughs> okay, so we have a little bit more than 15 minutes, so basically you each have about three minutes to summarize what you have discussed, and then we'll be taking away your flip chart pages or whatever else it is that you, that you used. And if you're interested in, the, in what came out of this workshop, email us. Our, em our email address is actually the, there. And um, so email us and we'll share the handouts and whatever we come up with. We'll type up the notes and share it with all of you. Okay, so, so start over in the corner here. Um, okay, so teams are social history, politics. Sorry, I volunteered to do this because I didn't want anybody else to have to read my writing. <laughs> politics, uh, the rising equality, feminism, unions, labour history literature because there's correspondence with James Joyce and uh, university history. Um, we tried to base it on just what we had there, even and we know if we'd read the letters there'd be like there'd be more. Um, speakers include historians, authors, uh, people who've specifically written about these people, um, family members, uh, representatives from the locality where they, they were, where they uh, lived. Uh, promotion would include website, social media, posters, maybe crowdsourced transcription, if that's not already done, blog, history and arts programs, history journals, newspapers, um, maybe an online exhibition, and you could advertise for more material, say, look, we've got these letters, does anybody have anything else that would add to this uh, archive? And uh, the audience would be like archivists, members of the family, um, historians, trade unions, local history groups. Uh, we could do lesson plans for schools and groups, uh, Joycean scholars because of the letters and academics interested in the writings and the uh, topics that these um, the correspondence was about. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so shall we move over to that side, the far side there? So, um, or just or actually, yeah, you could go over there, yeah. We got the uh, Kevin Perry collection, <laughs> which is uh, which I work at UCD, so we already I had a lot. I swear we had no, <laughs> we didn't talk. So I'd be a bit embarrassed because I don't know a whole, uh, as much as I should about the whole launch, but uh, uh, the themes we saw arising from this was, of course, the 1916 rising, even though it was uh, executed in 1920, um, which that, that means that'll be coming up uh, in four years. But um, uh, people, uh, yeah, the, the, the rising, uh, any of the decade of centenaries um, uh, interest, um, uh, Belvedere College, which was the secondary school we went to, um, uh, and he was a member of the Irish Volunteers, so that would be in there as well, um, and the social events that were happening around that time, so th those would be the themes. Um, uh, speakers, uh, you would uh, hopefully get some of the big historians like Dermot, Dermot Ferreter, uh, who actually did speak at the, at the launch. Uh, people like Connor Mulva as well, another Irish history um, lecturer, professor. 
uh, the education connection since he was a student and he didn't have a whole lot of time on earth, but uh, the, 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 what, what, what was happening in the UCD at the time um, that he was a student, uh, maybe his old school, uh, maybe you could get somebody from the, the school, Belvedere College, to speak. Um, as, far as, uh, as far as the audience, sorry, uh, family members, uh, extended family, uh, though you know I had no children himself, but um, family members, people that are interested in 1916, historians, archivists, um, and uh, he was, uh, grew up around Church Street, is it? And um, maybe uh, you could bring in the Church Street history so people that would be in local societies might be interested in attending. Um, the promotional aspect, uh, it's the UCD Archives collection, so, um, uh, which is digitized by the digital library, UCD Digital Library, so uh, you would um, have the, the, the actual material to promote as far as uh, with posters and panels, which I already showed uh, that we do have a set of four panels that describe the collection as well as the history, his history and execution, um, which are on, on exhibition and were on exhibition at the launch. Uh, web graphics, social media, of course. Um, and then uh, as a follow-up, uh, 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 exhibition panel tour as well, which I'm is sure currently <laughs> happening uh, at the Lexicon at the moment and then moving on through the country to different libraries throughout the year. So um, that's basically Okay, shameless self-promotion here. You've forgotten one possible type <laughs> of speaker because, of course, uh, as part of that collection, there's the Kevin Barry stained glass window that was done by the Clark yeah. Studios. <laughs> so you need an art historian Actually, there. the launch happened there at the window, so sorry. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so let's um, move on to... Sorry, I thought of another nice theme for the Kevin Barry one is because of like the stained glass window of like memory and how um, events like that are memorialized um, as well. That's just an idea I had. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Do you want me to point this way? Do you want to see the slides this way or should I... Um, um, it's okay. This, this way. way. Oh, okay. Okay, so we have the papers of John Millington Singh in Trinity College. Um, we started off by looking at a number of themes we could associate with it. So we discussed the whole uh, aspect of the Irish language in Singh. Um, we looked at the influence of Singh on European theater, the whole Abbey riots and the question of national identity, cultural purity. And then the last theme we discussed was uh, feminism and his depiction of women, etc. But we basically settled on the, his influence on European theatre because we started to you know, think about his influence on Martin McDonough and, his, and Martin McDonough's brother, etc. So we thought this would be a good um, theme to, to run the symposium on. <laughs> Thanks, Carmel. <laughs> so the audience and speakers then, um, you know, obviously playwrights, actors, directors, again, they angle on cinema, modern Irish cinema, and also European cinema. Um, drama scholars, people who are involved in cultural studies, and um, again, being Trinity, we looked at the, um, you know, Lur and the Samuel Beckett uh, Theatre uh, in Trinity. Um, again, tying in with European partners, partners like some of the smaller new European countries, Estonia, Lithuania, etc. Um, the Abbey Theatre, anybody involved in that. And then the wider public uh, amateur theatre groups and just anybody is interested in sing in general okay. and then the last thing is the promotion etc so again to try and tie it in with a theater festival or other similar national or european festivals and then to promote it using social media and the mainstream media and we ran out of time at that point okay <laughs> thanks a lot
Okay, so we had the Robinson collection of caricatures, and we kind of started out with these general themes of political cartoons, 18th century, satire, uh, art history, the medium, Prince Edmund Burke, and how Ireland was portrayed in the 18th century. And <coughs> so we framed our theme as kind of a, a research question, actually. So our question was, what were the purposes of the cartoons and who was the audience? So the speakers that we decided on would be uh, our historians, um, political speakers, modern cartoonists, as well as modern satirists, and maybe someone who is an expert on Edmund Burke, um, historian, sociologist, and as the collection was from um, Nicholas Robinson, and he's still alive, we thought it might be useful to have him come and discuss his collection and why he put these materials together and what his interests were. And so our audience would be um, people interested in history, art, political studies, media, um, politicians, as well as the general public, students. And for promotion, we kind of ran out of time as well. So we only got as far as the social media aspect. So Twitter, uh, Instagram, because these are visual images, we thought having an Instagram account would be helpful. Um, Facebook, blogs, and we made our own hashtag. 18 <laughs> that is impressive, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> and that's it. Great. Okay. Uh, Okay, um, so we got the Liam O'Leary archive, um, and Liam O'Leary was a filmmaker, film historian, and archivist, and a director and writer. Um, so the themes that we came up with were um, Irish filmmaking, Irish history, um, the Aran Islands, I think he did something about the man of Aran, um, and also uh, he was a member of the Irish Film Society, so it's kind of all around film and that kind of stuff. Um, so the speakers that we came up with, um, one well as family, um, like some because he has some some personal collections uh, within the within the collection. So somebody from his family maybe might like to talk a bit more about that. Um, then we have because uh, he did some programs with RTE. So we said um, there's a. There's a retired um, RT staff group, and um, so we thought that some of them might be interested because they might have met him at some stage or whatever. Um, then there's filmmakers um, within, I suppose, within Ireland, but also like Europe and um, that kind of stuff. And then um, cinematographers, um, the media, um, and then historians as well um, might be interested in speaking about him um, or speaking at the symposium. Um, then there's uh, an association called the Royal Television Society, um, so they might have some um, something, um, some might have some interest as well in speaking about him. And there's also, uh, I think he worked with um, the Abbey Theatre, um, so he somebody. Abbey Theatre could speak. Um, so some of the promotions I came up with, um, the RT website, so sorry, there's a few of us at this table working RT, so. <laughs> um, the RT website, uh, and then obviously the news, um, and Nationwide. <laughs> um, and then the Irish Film Institute, like a pr promotion, you know, within film films or whatever, and then uh, media students, you know, whoever's studying film studies, um, they, we could promote it within their groups, and then um, public libraries and cinematographers uh, across Ireland, so that was it. That's great, thanks very much. Okay, um, just another, um, just thought of another theme for the Liam O'Leary collection is um, like censorship in Ireland, um, and then also identity through film in Ireland, because a lot of Irish films that were made in the like early mid 20th century were all by American directors coming over to Ireland and in the diddly eye Irish thing. So, another thing. 
Okay, we have five minutes left, so um, actually two things. Uh, one for, this, for the same papers, um, that there were photographs of the Aran Islands that Singh himself took, so I think any historians of early photography, that kind of thing, would, would be interested in too. And then just one very minor thing, but you all focused on promoting the collection, which is great, but how about promoting the symposium? <laughs> you know, how do you actually make it clear that this thing is happening and that people should be coming and registering for the event? Think about that too. <laughs> um, okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna gather all of those sheets of paper. We're going to do up a, a little hand, a little page with all the conclusions that you came to. But what we were trying to do was not so much to gather information about these collections, but to get you to think in terms of how we would do this. And I hope we have achieved that. So thanks a million. And um, there's our email addresses. If you're interested in this material, we'll email it to you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. That's great, thanks very much, guys. Um, we have uh, a few more minutes left until our next session, which is in here in the Goldsmith.